People say we spun spiders' webs together across the valley, but that's not true. It may look like it, but it's not. We're the flying men of Yungas. On our ropes, we're like birds. And we go faster than astronauts. The Yungas region in Bolivia. Jungle and steep cliffs. Where people don't walk, they fly. These birdmen are known as cocaleros, coca harvesters. They use ropes to swing across the narrow valleys, suspended from ancient rusting pulleys. Just 30 seconds from one side to the other. By foot, it would have taken more than an hour. Oh, this must be about six or seven years old. And before that, there was nothing. No, no, no. Nothing. We had to walk down to the bottom, cross the river, and then climb up the other side. It used to be quite a hike. We'll get home much more quickly this way. This is not a horizontal country. The Yungas valleys are like a sudden staircase between the towering Cordilleras of the Andes, more than 4,000 meters high, and the green Amazon basin. Here in the dramatic vertical landscape, the inhabitants have fashioned this unusual way to move around more quickly. Simple thin metal wires, normally used for fencing, stretching as far across as 400 meters. It's almost a form of public transport. There are about 20 of these cables strung across the valley. All day long, people and goods fly across the river 200 meters below. At each end, homemade tethers that in theory provide stability and safety. Some of the wires have been in use for 20 years and have slackened dramatically. The cocaleros have never bothered replacing them. No, it doesn't break. It'll never break. It's made of galvanized steel. And besides, we've put four of them across here. To prevent the pulleys from becoming unfastened, the cocaleros use string at each end as a kind of peg. It's a safety measure, so the nut doesn't get loose from the bolt. The string helps keep it in place, otherwise it might all collapse. To hang on to the pulley, the cocaleros simply attach themselves with bits of fabric and cloth. Mm. 
This is how you come at it. See. This is how we do it. Yes, so sufficient. Is that enough to keep you from falling off? Sufficient is it? Enough? Sufficient is. Oh, of course it is. Sufficient is for I two still here. I get ten to the. It's enough for two people even, even three. I get ten to the here. Three. Three is it? Yeah. We use the branches and leaves as a kind of break to stop ourselves so we don't crash into the other side. They don't blister your hands? No, not at all. Okay, I'm off now to the other side. I'm going to be flying like a plane. Even at age 72, Don Ignacio continues to fly across the valley every day to tend to his coca plantation on the other side of the mountain. <sighs> Since the price of coffee collapsed, coca has taken over as the main crop for the Yungas. It's been cultivated since the time of the Incas, a form of narcotic chewed by the locals to overcome tiredness. It's harvested three times a year and is worth approximately 30% more than coffee nowadays. Don Ignacio was one of the first to settle in the valley and it was his idea to install the cable skyway. I first came here in 1955. I was the one who founded the community and everything that you see here. There was nothing before. There was nothing to get across. We used to carry everything on our backs, just like pack animals. That's when I thought about having the system of pulleys and cables. I bought steel wires and I managed to stretch them across the valley using some rope. Don Ignacio can neither read nor write, and testing his wire cables was a hit and miss affair. Everything was guesswork. Well, no one wanted to go on them at the beginning. No one trusted it. So the first time we tried it out with a sack full of stones. If it made it across, then we knew we could do, too. Don Ignacio's invention brought about a dramatic change in the lives of the cocaleros who are now able to easily send heavy loads across the valley. Even today, though, there are those who don't trust the flimsy wires that crisscross the valley. Maria's husband was killed in an accident on the wires, and she now refuses to use them. Well, there'd already been an accident. My husband was killed here. He fell off and fell to his death into the river. He lost his balance somehow. Well, he just fell off. He fell out of his harness and fell. Uh, I'm not really sure what happened, but uh, he was on his own when he fell. Three people have fallen to their deaths in the past 20 years, mostly as a result of negligence. Like Maria, most of the women prefer to cross on foot. Well, the bridge is for the women. We're too scared to cross on the cables, so most of the women cross here. It's quite nice because we often stop to bathe in the river. You see, look how far my husband fell, all the way from up there down to the river. His body was shattered, his guts were splattered everywhere. It was horrible. I'm really tired though, because it is a steep climb. And my feet hurt from walking so much. Despite the physical exertion, Maria still prefers walking to taking the sky cables. It must be half an hour that we've been here. 
Sin esfuerzo. No. Sin esfuerzo. I got over without any effort. Tranquilo. It was easy. It's part of our way of life now. We always use some coca before we start working. It also stops us getting hungry and allows us to work like dogs. We could fall off a tree and not feel anything. In the valley, the work days are long and arduous. The hardest is the harvesting of mandarins, which grow in abundance. But they have to be picked within two days of ripening, otherwise they rot. Maria and her new partner, Alex, can obviously only sell the fresh mandarins in market, so timing is crucial. It's always a rush, and that's when you might have an accident from having to hurry so much. You might get careless and fall. That's why the cables aren't as reliable as they say. It's like Russian roulette. I don't want to be widowed twice over. It's scary starting with someone like him. I'd rather have met someone from a different part of the country. Or move out and live elsewhere, where it's less dangerous. In the valley, danger is never far away. When the baskets full of mandarins don't quite reach their destination, for example. Ah, oh, damn it. Ah, they're swinging back the other way now. The only choice is to go and fetch them, a high-risk operation. The baskets weigh as much as 50 kilos. Alex is barely fastened properly to the pulley. At 200 meters, any mistake could be fatal. You should film this. Bugger it. It's... Uh... This is how accidents occur. The harness can slip and you just fall backwards. All the way into nothing. It almost happened to me once. I was in a hurry and I wasn't fastened properly. Just for a basket of fruit. A one-hour walk away on the other side of the mountain, Severo has just returned from picking coca. The leaves are put out to dry. One month's work of harvesting. If they're not dried out, then they could turn black. And black leaves aren't worth as much as the green ones. I put them on the ground when there's no sun. They say the mirror attracts the sun. The sun sees the mirror and it pops out. And that's why I put mirrors here. Life for the cocaleros such as Severo has become a little easier since the election of Evo Morales in the presidential elections of 2005. Evo was the first native Indian head of state in South America and an outspoken advocate of the coca farmers. Under his rule, the laws that previously imposed some restrictions on coca growing were relaxed. Ever since Evo has been in office, things have changed. Before, there were embargoes and other serious restrictions. The other governments had said they wanted to stop coca altogether. No one listened to our side of the story. They said coca is used to make cocaine. But it's not true. Coca is not cocaine. You need to add a lot of chemicals to make cocaine from coca leaves. Severo says he's never seen cocaine. As far as he's concerned, his coca is a powerful therapy against fatigue, pain and altitude sickness. But because of the fight against drugs, he also has to travel to the officially sanctioned market in La Paz, in Bolivia's capital. It's my cuarto. This is my room. This is where I sleep. And I keep all my clothes here. And my coca leaves. This is how I live. 
I'll sell two bundles of coca in the city, and then with the money, I'll buy some supplies. And whatever is left, I'll give to my wife. She lives in La Paz with the girls. They can't live out here. The problem is the school, because the nearest school is over the mountains on the other side. And the kids are scared of snakes and, and things like that. Severo has finished harvesting his coca. He'll soon be heading off to market in La Paz and get a chance to see his family again. In the past month, he's amassed 50 kilos of coca leaves, which he needs to get to the other side of the valley, to the nearest road. Severo is also bringing a large basket of mandarins for his wife and daughters. Why did you yell out like that? <laughs> Just out of happiness. Huh? Happiness about what? Well, about flying like a bird across the valley. After the thrill of the crossing, it takes Severo a back-breaking 10 minutes to drag each of his three 25-kilo packs up the mountain to the roadside. I'm wiped out. This is killing me. The next morning, Severo will take the first bus heading to La Paz. <laughs> the road that snakes its way through the Valley of Cables is the main artery that links the mountain ranges with the plains 4,000 meters below. Hard to believe, but this narrow dirt road is as busy as any modern highway. On the way down are manufactured goods from La Paz. On the way up, rice, fruit, and cattle from the fertile Amazonian pastures. Two-way traffic causes vehicles to teeter on the edges of precipices. Crosses in memory of victims of accidents are everywhere. The Bolivians call this road El Camino de la Muerte, the road of death. The road starts 4,000 meters up in La Paz, the economic capital of Bolivia. Marco, aged 23, is a vachero, a trucker specialized in the transport of cattle. His job is to drive down the road of death as far as Amazonia and load up cattle. We're getting ready for the trip. The truck comes from Europe. Like all the others, it's second-hand, but it's been patched up. Ready to take on the worst, the roads can throw at it. With 600,000 kilometers already on the clock, it's the first time Marco is taking it out. His own truck has long since driven more than one million kilometers. These trucks never die? No, because we constantly repair them. Everything gets fixed up in Bolivia. Mm. Marco is always accompanied on his trips by his cousin, Wilson. Traveling alone is far too dangerous on the road of death. O sea, este trabajo genera más dinero. 
otro... Well, the job pays well. Que otros trabajos y... If I didn't earn what I do, then I won't be able to send my kids to college in the future. I have small kids, they need clothes, milk, the usual stuff. That's why I keep doing this dangerous job. Marco never leaves without first kissing his children goodbye. I always do this. To have them here during the journey. Hola. Hello. Te desporta bien? Being good. Seguro. Sí. Are you sure? Yeah. Te vas a portar bien. Listen, you behave yourself. When I get back, I'll I'll come and see you. What would you like me to bring back for you? Well, what is there in San Borja? All sorts of fruits. Banana. Eso quieres? Do they have bananas? Yeah, Would you like some? Yeah. I'll bring some, but only if you've been good, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ben. Yes, yes. Marco doesn't go inside, as he's going through a divorce with the kid's mother. His wife could no longer stand the strain of waiting for her husband to return safely from the road of death. <laughs> I pray to the Lord that I may come back safe and sound from the journey. Every time I leave to drive, I always pray to the Lord. And do you speak to your truck? Always. What kind of things do you tell it? I often say, how's it going, kid? Or things like, OK, kid, we need to get there and come back, all right? I do it all the time. Sometimes when it has some problems, I tell it, why are you behaving like this? I've given you everything you need, oil, petrol. Does it understand? I, I think it does, actually, yeah. OK, let's go. It's the start of a trip that will take 24 hours. Marco travels the road of death once or twice a week. A 900 kilometer round trip on one of the world's most dangerous highways. His wages of fear, 140 euros a month. I'm going to stop at the highest point on the road to say a mass, to bring me luck. La Cumbre, at an altitude of 4,700 meters, it's the highest point on the journey and marks the start of the road of death. Below the cross that overlooks the descent, Yatiris, or Indian shaman priests, have gathered. For a few pennies, the truckers invoke their help to pay their respects to Pachamama, the goddess of the earth. Did you bring any coca? Wilson. Where's the coca? Here it is. What's your name? Marco. My name is Esteban. Listen, Mr. Marco, we'll hold a ceremony for you. A little ceremony. Where are you headed? To San Borja. San Borja? Well, we'll call up the spirits of nature and the devils. What kind of truck do you have? It's a Volvo. Which model? An FL7. All the spirits are here. We call them Achachilas in Indian. Uh, Aymara. There's also Pachamama and the Pachatata. We call on them to help us, to make sure there is plenty, that there is health, and that his truck has no problems on the journey. Where are you going again? San Borja.
Samborha, we pray that your business does well, your truck, the Volvo FL7, number plate 956. Let everyone be blessed, the truck, the Volvo, everyone on board. An offering to Pachamama for the benefit of everyone. Good health. Before setting off again, Marco baptizes his truck with beer. Now we can travel more at ease. We know now that the spirits will be protecting us from danger. Good luck, young Mark. Have a great trip. Always. May you be granted money and health. May the Lord of Cumbre bless you. From here, the road of death drops dramatically down towards the valley. The trucks hurtle down an uneven 3,000 meter descent in less than 50 kilometers to the Yungas Valley. At this point, the road is still surfaced. But the greatest danger is the constant fog caused by warm air from Amazonia meeting cold air from the Andes. It's always drizzling around here, but uh, it's okay. Usually the fog is thicker, and you can't see more than two meters in front of you. That's why so many buses and trucks have fallen into the ravine. Most of the accidents here are caused by fog, especially at night time. But at least we can see where we're going today. 2,000 meters lower down, the fog begins to dissipate. But this is where the greatest danger begins. It can soon get really narrow now. When I reach this point, I stop to pray, and I ask for the Lord for help. If I have to back up to let another vehicle through, for example, the problem here is the two-way traffic. This stretch of road is now unsurfaced, all the way to Amazonia. All traffic has to be on the left-hand side of the road now. You see, since the driver is sitting on the left, by the precipice, it's easier to see where you're going. You can put your head out of the window and see how close your tires are to the edge. If we were on the right, we wouldn't see anything if we had to reverse. And the trucks often do have to reverse because this road is simply not wide enough. On the road of death, the rule is that the vehicle that's descending has to back up to the nearest wider stretch of road. The wheel's just centimeters from the edge. This is often when accidents happen. truck or a bus is full of passengers, the cost in human lives can be terrible. Marco himself has had several close shaves. I remember the one time that one of my wheels was over the edge. When I got off to have a look, I panicked. I got back on and, and tried to get back on the road, but, but I couldn't. I was so scared. I was shaking from head to foot. I felt like never driving again.
Marco, however, has become an expert, and today he knows all about the dangers he may come across. Here you have to look out for rock falls. At every turn lurks potential danger. Here you must not break. Which is why you must drive much more slowly than, uh, than before. If you break here, you'll go flying off because of all the mud. This truck was lucky. It skidded into the side and got stuck in the undergrowth. We have to get all the mud off here. There's no way to move it. And for the driver and his wife, the only thing to do was to dig it out. Oh, I've been trying to dig here for an hour. Will you do it? Can you manage? Yeah, I think so. But there's one stretch of road that's even narrower and more dangerous. An alternative route has been dug out of the mountainside, but until last year, more than 200 trucks a day had to negotiate this road from hell. The surface is less than three meters wide, and there's a 500 meter drop into the ravine. These days, only tourists on bicycles and thrill seekers use this stretch of highway. Crosses litter the side of the road, and the horror stories make up the trade in stock of Eduardo, the tourist guide to the road of death. Over the past 50 years, about 1,200 people have been killed here, and last year was the worst. 180 people died in just one year. Even tourists are not safe. Eight cyclists have fallen to the bottom of the ravine, providing yet more stories for Eduardo. This is where two Israelis were killed. And uh, a few years ago, a woman lost control of her bike and fell 120 meters there over, over the edge. And there, you can see the Israeli flag. That's the accident uh, I was telling you about. It happened two months ago. Two years ago, yeah. you see there the other team yeah. is they follow down one track. The track have more or less 22 persons. All the all the, the trucks fly in the same to the airplane yeah. is down. Eduardo arrived on the scene just after the accident and took part in the rescue operation. <laughs> How far did it fall? Oh, about 180 meters. The victims were in terrible condition, with legs and arms missing and bits of the truck through their bodies. It was awful. There were about 15 people here, all of them dead. Men, women and children. Niños, como puedes ver, mujeres, una señora. One woman was still alive. Uh, we took us uh, 30 minutes to bring her back up to the road. But just as we were about to get there, she died. And that was the worst part of it for me. Helicopters can't reach here, and it's a real problem. And it's why we can only save the people that are closer to the road after an accident. If you spent time searching through the ravine, you'd find the skeletons of many people that, uh, that couldn't be saved. Four hundred kilometers further down, Marco has finally arrived in Amazonia. It's taken him twenty hours of non-stop driving, without any sleep. This is the Bolivian far west, plains as far as the eye can see. Millions of head of cattle scattered across a territory as large as Texas. Porque corres apresurado, 
sin controlar en esta curva o en la otra está la muerte segura the song talks of the unlucky driver who drives recklessly and faces certain death. I'm happy and I thank the Lord who has looked after me along the way. But on this road, you see, the, the risk is you might fall asleep behind the wheel. When you're coming down the mountainside with all the turns and bends, your adrenaline keeps you awake. But here the road is so straight and you're so tired you can just nod off like that. San Borja, with 20,000 inhabitants, is little more than a large, dusty village, but it's the capital of Bolivia's cattle industry. This is where Marco and his assistant, Wilson, will wait for a dealer to give them cattle to transport. In San Borja, everyone knows Don Umberto. His trademark leather hat screwed to his head he scours the ranches to select the cattle that he will resell in La Paz. Here in the state of Beni, there's a lot of money. Cattle rearing is a huge business. In the San Borja region, the rich own up to 50,000 head of cattle. Even the smallest rancher has at least 500, and then after that, oh, it's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. These cows will be transported all the way to La Paz, where they will be slaughtered. In a country where refrigerator trucks are rare, it's the best way to guarantee the quality of the meat. Don Umberto is choosy. He's interested in only the best. The small thin ones, like, like that black one over there, that's, those are no good to me. They would never survive the trip. They die of fatigue. See, the big ones, however, they're much stronger. Don Humberto will pay 2,000 bolivianos, about $250, to transport his cattle. But the journey is undertaken entirely at the truck driver's own risk. And it's Marco that's responsible for the cattle arriving safely in La Paz. If the cows get hurt on the way, or if one of them dies, I'm the one that will have to pay. Each cow is worth as much as 1,900 or 2,000 bolivianos, which is what I get paid for the entire trip. The role of the assistant is crucial. Wilson has to take care of the cattle on the return journey. I have to make sure the animals don't fall over or step on each other, uh, otherwise they might die. Take these cows to Dona Valentina. Here's her cell phone number. Don't worry, I'll drive slowly. Are the cattle tired? No, they've had a good rest. But uh, you better make sure they all arrive in good condition, OK? All right, Don Alberto, don't worry. There's not a minute to waste. To avoid any suffering to the animals, Marco will head back as fast as possible. If all goes well, they'll be in La Paz within 24 hours. There is only one way to keep going all the night. Tiene coca? Do you have any coca? <laughs> yep. Dame dos bolivianos. Give me two bolivianos worth. Ta. <laughs> 
Without coca, I don't think I could keep going through the night. It helps you stay awake and makes you less scared. Scared of what? Scared of the road, because there's so many stories about it. For example, they say that on, on this stretch, there's a woman who walks along the side of the road. But when you get closer, she always disappears. For Marco and Wilson, it will be a long night. They will pause only briefly to get their breath back. In the Valley of the Cables, Severo is getting ready to leave for La Paz to sell his 50 kilos of coca leaves in the market. It's a five-hour bus journey along the road of death. He's accompanied by Edwin, the son of old Ignacio, the man who invented the cable skyway. Papi! Dad, I'll be back Saturday, okay? Fearless on their cables, the flying men of Yungas are far less at ease when they have to go on the road of death. We trust in the grace of God when we travel. There could be landslides, and we're just as scared coming back as we are going. That's why we go so rarely. But for Severo, the dangers of the road mean nothing. He hasn't seen his family in more than a month. I worry about them the whole time, of course. I wonder if they're okay and doing well. The Villa Fatima market in La Paz. It's the only place in the country where the cocaleros are allowed to sell their crop. Even so, it's estimated that as much as a third of all the coca leaves that are sold here end up in the laboratories of cocaine traffickers. In the market, the cholitas, the native Indian women, rule the roost. They are the ones who buy and sell the coca. We have to haggle with the buyers to get the best prices. A furtive glance here, an appraisal there. It's a discreet game between seller and buyer. Do you have any other bags? No, just these two. How much did you give me last time? because I want more this time. The woman decides not to buy, but Severo soon finds someone else. I'm selling. I'm selling everything. Uh, but we'll need to get uh, a good price. Who are you dealing with? Well, this woman over here. For how much? 700. 700 bolivianos for each of the 25 kilo bags. Severo makes about $180 for one month's work. He lives in a poor district of La Paz, high up in the city. This is my house. Si. 
Visita. Hello. We've got company. Hola, Erika. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Estás bien? Hola. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Estás bien nomás? Besito. Beso, pues. Ella es mi esposa. Ella es mi wife. My eldest daughter and the little one. This is where they live. My wife looks after the kids, sends them to school, does the washing, and cooks for them. Is it hard for when your husband's not here? Well, of course, because we have no news from him. When he doesn't arrive, I'm scared. I'd rather he walk than take the cables. This is the room where my wife cooks. And this is my room. And this is where the three of them live. I'm exhausted. I want my daughters to have a better life than I've had, without the same hardships. I don't want them to be farmers. I want them to study and, and find a job in the city as, as secretaries or in an office or whatever they like, so long as they have a choice when they grow up. For Marco and Wilson and their 15 cows, the return journey is far from over. The hardest part is still lies ahead, the steep climb up into the Andes. In the rear, the cattle are starting to feel the strain of the trip. But there's nowhere to stop. The road is far too narrow. Wilson, go, go and take a look at the cows, will you? No, it's okay, they're fine. They're fine. But the cattle are exhausted, and Wilson has to stop them from lying down. It's okay, they're fine. They're all well. In just four hours, the truck will climb 3,000 meters. It's the final blow for the animals. Well, they're sort of wiped out. But it won't be too long now. It's the altitude that's getting to them, you see, and the weather. Well, we'd have been on the road for 24 hours soon. I'm really tired. It's uh, the only way to keep going. When you don't sleep well, that's when you really age. They say a night without sleep means you live one year less. I mean, look at me, I'm only 23, but I look older because of all the sleepless nights and trips that I've made behind the wheel. Eventually, the truck staggers across the peak of Cumbre. 4,700 meters up. La Paz is now very close. I'll carry on doing this until I've paid for my truck. And that way, I can work for myself. Most drivers start off like me and then end up owning their trucks. I want my own truck, so I'll need to keep working like a dog. After 25 hours on the road, Marco completes his side of the deal. 
All 15 cattle have survived the journey, only to have been dropped off at the municipal slaughterhouse, where they'll be killed overnight. Marco and Wilson will rest and then head once more down to the plains for another consignment of cattle. Marco estimates that it will take him about 10 years to save the nearly $20,000 he'll need to buy his truck. After spending two days with his family, Severo leaves La Paz to return to the valley. Back with Ignacio and among the flying men of the Yungas and the coca fields on the road of death. <laughs>